All right, so today what we're building is on the screen, we're building a web application. And really there's a couple of things that we're gonna dive deeper into that are new to us here. But, but for sure, one of the things that we haven't done a lot of that we'll work on are one-to-many relationships. And so we've done one-to-one, -one, we've done many-to-many. -many. This is an example of one-to-many relationships. So as an example, you can see that my teachers here like Jamie, uh, Jamie has many classes. And so it's safe to say that a teacher has many classes and a class only has one teacher. So there is a classic example of a one-to-many. Uh, then we are also gonna have uh, an entity for the days of the week. So there will be a class called day and a day will have many classes. So there's another one to many each day. A day can have many classes. Of course, it can have one class. It could have zero classes. So if we jump onto some of these days, like a Saturday, there are no classes on the weekend. So definitely one to many relationships are gonna be something that we hit here. We're also gonna hit something new um, called the repository pattern. And the repository pattern, this will be the first time that we extract our database logic out of our controllers and we put it into a reusable pattern um, that is a class and, and I'll explain it a little bit more, but we're gonna basically take that database logic and put it into a class and a reusable class. So if you guys think about that tutorial you did where you did that, you took the database logic and you extracted it out into like an interface and then the, a class implemented the interface. But if you guys think about that auction app that you did, for every database entity, you had to make a new interface and a new class, right? We're gonna make a reusable class uh, using what's called generics. Okay, so definitely one-to-many relationships are new. We're gonna have this thing called a repository pattern that is new. That's the second thing that's new. And we are just gonna do a little bit deeper dive on link. Uh, literally up until this point in the, where we are in this class, you know, chapter 12, we've had one to two pages of link. We haven't really hit link in much detail. So we're gonna dive a little bit deeper into link. So this is what we're building. I encourage you to code along. So let's boot up Visual Studio. And I'm going to create a new project. C Sharp Web Application, ASP.NET Core Web App. And I'm just going to call this my class, or just call it Rankin Schedule. Rankin Class Schedule. And all those defaults are good. We will start with the models. Now, we're at a point where we're gonna start having a lot of different classes in this models folder. We're gonna start having more than just what are called your domain models. And so to this point, we've, we've only had domain models, um, but we're gonna start putting some more classes in here. So I'm gonna do a little bit of organization. I'll start by adding a folder, call it domain models. And domain models are those C-sharp classes that tie into our database um, that will make the, the tables. And so what we typically were putting under the models folder now is in a domain models. And you'll see a few more folders that, that I create. And I'm going to start by adding a C-sharp class. And let's start with teacher. And we're going to have an ID, a first name, a last name. And as I showed earlier, a teacher has a collection of classes. And so I'm just going to kind of bring in the old one at a time. Teacher ID, 
first name, last name. Obviously, I'm going to give you guys time to, to code along. Okay, bring in data annotations. This is all standard stuff with our attributes on our properties. All right, let's bring in a read only full name, right? So these are read write properties. Of course, to have a full name that returns a concatenated first name and last name. And a collection of classes. Now you're gonna notice the, the, the type is not created yet, so that's not gonna compile. And instead of defining this as you know a list you just anything that implements i collection can be our classes now it is also something that's um uh, uh, uh beneficial to say hey when i construct a teacher object Let's go ahead and initialize our classes uh, as a new hash set. And we, we discussed this of type class. The benefit of making it a hash set is that you cannot have duplicates, right? So hash sets versus list, you can store duplicate keys in a list, but you cannot store duplicate values or keys, I should say, not values. Uh, in in a hash set so um, so we're gonna have a collection of classes here we define that as the hash set which cannot store um, cannot store duplicates we also saw our next domain models there were days so I'll create a class called day, and a day had many classes. So just like a teacher had a many, right? So again, it's just worth reiterating that we are defining our database relationships by where the, where the objects are in the classes. So one teacher has many classes, right? I think this is very intuitive. I really like how just by defining where the the collections are, you're creating these relationships. Um, so a teacher has many classes. That's a one to many. Uh, let's add a class called day. And our day has a an ID and a name. So Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and the like and a collection of classes. And just like we did before, we will initialize our collection in the constructor. And I'm, if I didn't say it yesterday, I'll reiterate it today. This line eight um, is not mandatory, but it is, in my opinion, um, just makes it more understandable for the developer, right? So this convention, this will happen automatically. Line eight, it will initialize your collection. It might not initialize it to a hash set, but it will initialize it automatically. But I, I personally like uh, initializing your collections in the constructor for readability purposes, right? For, for the developers to read your code and understand what's going on. All right, so that leaves the last domain model left, which is type class. So let's go ahead and create the type of class. Now, the, it's worth saying that it's not necessarily a good thing to take a keyword, like the word class, notice in line three, this is a keyword, it's in blue in C sharp, 
The word class has a very specific meaning and use that keyword as your identifier with a capital letter. These are different things and it's probably not a good practice. Nonetheless, that's what I'm doing here. Let's go ahead and define our ID, which is our primary key. Our classes have a title and a class number, such as this class is Database Driven Web Development 2. That is the title of this class that we are in. And the number is AWD1115. Right? So in this case, our class numbers must be between 100 and 500. And it is, in fact, required. We mark our data type as nullable. But yet it is, it is required. So in the database, it will not accept nulls. Okay, but by marking this nullable, I will tell you my experience is that that will actually give you the correct error messages in your views when you do your data validation. So if you leave that little question mark off, I've seen it many times where these error messages are not the correct error messages in the views. This is an interesting property that if you take the time to kind of read, you know, how many people are familiar with military time? A little bit. How would you say eight? How would you say eight twenty-six military time? Sorry. A.M. Thank you. Yeah, eight twenty-six. Right. How do you say one p.m. in military time? Thirteen hundred. Right. So. Um, this property is military time and four characters long. You can kind of see a regular expression written that accepts the, the numeric values zero through nine, string length of four, and the display name just says time. So the property is military time, but the display name that the that you can use in the view will just say time. The next piece is that a class has one teacher and a class has one day. And so we need references, which are, you know, basically to our foreign keys. And so we're going to bring in a foreign key property and a navigation property for our teachers and for our days. And so you have done this before where you bring in a foreign key property, teacher ID, and a navigation property that is a type of teacher. And we say validate never on the navigation property to kind of avoid some validation issues that, that don't need to exist. Uh, again, you've seen probably at this point, if you don't put this validate never, that you could even supply a teacher ID, but since you don't supply a full teacher, that can cause validation error errors to happen in your view. So we don't want that. So we say validate never on our navigation properties. Okay, so if we save that now, Um, to kind of go back today and just look, our day is now compiling and our teachers are now compiling. And so we have our three domain models queued up. All right, the next steps are to wire up our database and seed some data into our database. So let's close our models. Let's go to our NuGet package manager and install Entity Framework, SQL Server, and the Tools package.
Okay, so now if I look under installed, I see that both of those are green check marks. And so in our app settings and our program CS, we need to make a connection string here. So inside of app settings, again, I would copy and paste and I'll call this class, I always like calling this my connection string, class schedule CS. We're using local DB version of Microsoft SQL Server. The database is called class schedule and that defines our connection string inside of app settings. And then as we typically do in our program CS, we need to add a reference to that connection string uh, that uses a context file that we have not yet created. So after line four, I'm going to paste this line of code. Now we have not created um, this class. So we're, we're going to create a context class that is not yet created. I'm also going to say using the models folder. So rank in class schedule dot models. And this is, we renamed our connection string to class schedule CS. So that name right there needs to match right there. And of course we need to create this class next. So let's go ahead and make that context file. And again, we're going to organize some of these different classes into folders. I'm going to make a new folder here. And this is going to be called data layer. Okay, and this is going to be where we put a lot of the files that help us interact with the database, including our context file and that repository pattern class that we're going to create and a few others. So inside of data layer, we will create class schedule context. Let's copy that name. Right click, add a class. Yes, sir. No. No, these, these are not strict names. Okay. So there's my data layer. There's my class schedule context. And that should resolve, I believe, because we're using models. Maybe a dot data layer. You gotta call it your I gotta data. put it the dot data layer on, okay. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, so let's do the dot data layer and let's inherit from the DB context. Okay, then that's happy. Now if I take the dot data layer off. Yeah, okay. I thought I thought it would be smart enough, but not it's not. Okay, moving on. All right, very boilerplate constructor. Taking in options and passing those up to the parent DB context constructor. We are going to have three tables. Public DB set of day called, whoop, called days one second 
Okay, uh, we'll take the suggestion and bring in the using statement. Um, I have a, f you know, probably there's some ways around this other than than what I'm doing, you know, such as, such as, um, yeah, I don't know, doesn't matter. Okay, days. We have a a table called days public db set of teacher called teachers and we can set our days to null null by default our teachers to null by default unless you you know put data into them public db set of class called classes and let's build our on model creating protected override void on model creating okay so this is where we're going to seed our data All right, and uh, as we've done in the past, you could just put all your seed data in one place or you could kind of separate that out and make uh, individual files with seed data in them and that kind of cleans up your context. Um, so we'll go ahead and do that. And so right now under models, we have data layer and domain models. Let's add a third folder for our seed data, basically. We'll call it configuration. And our first class in here will be our day config. And as we did yesterday, we inherit from I entity type configuration called day. Control dot enter brings in the using. Control dot enter again brings in domain models and a third time control dot enter implements the interface and prefer to call this entity and then you seed the data in this method by saying entity has data and seven days of the week with their IDs all right now that we have this config file in our context file we need to use it and we do that by saying model builder lowercase m model builder apply configuration new and we say day config okay and I am doing this in in this order um, because day config doesn't need anything else, right? Um, and so I want to create my days of the week before I create like a class that needs a day of the week, right? So I'm kind of top to bottom doing day first, um, and then I'll do my teacher next. So let's continue using this kind of pattern with our configuration day config we'll do a teacher config next add a class called teacher config implements i entity type this control dot enter control dot enter three times and let's make some teachers now entity Teacher IDs and
And so let's bring those teachers into my new teacher config. And last but not least, we get to add our classes. Seed some classes. So let's add class config. Uh, one thing that we learned about yesterday is changing the default cascading deletes uh, and how we can use Fluent API to uh, change the delete behavior to restrict. And so we are looking at this from a class point of view. And so you say the entity, the class, has one teacher, has one, and you use a little lambda expression. So the class has one C representing the class entity. So it has one teacher. And that teacher And so what's the relationship from the teacher back to the class? So a little lambda. The teacher has many classes. So from the class, class has one teacher. That from a teacher, so the with many represents the teacher. The teacher can have many classes. And so you say, hey, uh, on delete, restrict. And so if you delete the teacher, if you try to delete the teacher, but the teacher is listed on classes, that's going to cause a database exception to occur, saying you cannot do that. Therefore, you have to handle that in your software and say, hey, you can't delete a teacher if the teacher has classes. And so now let's add some C data. Now it's a title. Sure. Intro to C sharp. Um, one hundred teacher ID would be one day ID. Now the way this is built is, you know, just one day of the week. I'm kind of, we could always change it to be more like a ranking schedule, but for right now the class runs, we're just gonna let it run on one day. And military time is 0800. Keeping all the same teachers there. Um, I'll add maybe four more classes with the other teachers. So this would be class ID of five and number 104, teacher ID two.
Oh, let's change this title. Intro to So you can kind of see I'm just keeping the classes IDs going up. I'm also incrementing the numbers, even though these numbers don't have to be um, unique. I, I don't remember any rules that that number had to be unique, but I am making them unique numbers. Teacher IDs, I put, I put me as the teacher on the first four classes, and then I'm just saying, you know, teacher two, teacher three. Uh, what are the days? Day one, day two, day three. And then let's do day four, and then these classes can all run on day one, all the other. So classes five and six can run on day one. Class seven can run on day one. Teacher ID of, I think I had at least four teachers. I had five teachers, so teacher ID of four. Day ID of one, starting at 0800, and I'll do one more class. Intro to networking, 107, teacher ID of five. That should, that should work. And back in our context, just as we did before, model builder, new class config. We should be ready to seed our database with some data. All right, let's see if we can create our first migration and update a database. Add migration initial. Let's see what errors out. If we have any errors. Okay, create, we should create three tables, one, two, and three. Wait a minute, yeah, one, two, three. And have some relationships between those tables, looking good. So the classes has some foreign keys. So the class table has a couple foreign key columns. And we got some insert data going on into our days, into our teachers, and to our classes. Some indexes going on that helps us look data up, right? An index like in your book, an index in your book helps you look up information in your book. An index in a database does the same thing. And then we've got some drop tables if we run the down. So um, the migration file looks good. So let's run that migration file with update database. And if that works, which it does, we should be able to go into our Object Explorer, click on the Refresh button, see a class schedule database with three tables. And let's view the data for classes. Awesome. View the data for days, view the data for teachers, and Let's look at the designer for our teachers. Primary key, looking good. Let's look at the designer for days. Primary key. Last but not least, view the designer here. And you could see we've got a couple of foreign keys created. And you can kind of see on this, if we delete a class, um, you can kind of see here there's a delete cascade, but there's not a delete cascade. We did set it up to not cascade on teachers and classes. So whether we want that to cascade on the other column that's 
maybe something you we could consider but nonetheless let's close all tabs that's all looking good close all tabs and we're ready to continue okay so where we're going with this is um, we we need to have a little bit uh, understanding of link and so we've used link so far you know link is used for um, hitting a database working with data in a database and you know think of it as an alternative to SQL statements so select from where uh, link goes uh, where from select you know it's the same kind of uh, same kind of ideas same commands even but but it's you know uh, what we use in the C sharp world as opposed to working directly with SQL and in, in the database and so when we're in C sharp world we use link to hit our context right because it's the context that interacts with the database and so you can kind of see here a couple of interfaces and um, there's the I queryable interface which can store a link query right to store a link query, you can store it in iQueryable. However, you can't store data in iQueryable. You know, so if you're saying, hey, here's my query, but you don't execute it yet, you can store a query in iQueryable versus iEnumerable. When I hear iEnumerable, you're enumerating over a collection, you're looping over a collection. Um, you can store data in that, right? So. So when you actually run this to list, to list will execute the query. So it's it's this command here to list this this method that will store the data. And of course, if you just want to use one statement, you know you could just say hey var books, and and get that to a list. But just kind of pointing out something that's queryable can't store data. Something that can store data could be stored in enumerable. You know. What do you typically do when you're when you're using link? Well, you're you're filtering. You filter with a where clause, and you often do sorting. And so you've got an order by, order by the title, order by descending. These are link methods: order by and order by descending. Um, when you have a book by its ID, of course you can use a where clause again remember just broadly speaking where is your filter you're filtering down results um in this example well okay so this is a nice when when you run this find method the find is specifically looking at primary key values so these two lines do the same thing that line and this line uh, so having a where clause where you're doing a lambda expression uh, and then saying give me the first value that you return uh, versus a find where you hit the primary key. In this case, this lambda expression, notice it goes down to a, uh, a, a property here, the book's genre. The genre has a name property equal to mystery um, and all of that. So this is pretty standard link. And because we write SQL, it's also similar. Like if I remember one critique of the C sharp class, it was like, Mr. G, we spent all this time on SQL. And then you just like threw us to the wolves with link. And, um, you know, it's because it's just so similar that I feel like if you have a you know, I think you guys should have a grasp of, you know, what these methods are doing. Just getting the initial exposure is what we're doing here. So again, building a query in an iQueryable and it says it cannot use implicit typing here. Implicit typing is this piece right here where you just say var, right? Um, okay, but really, I, I can't say that I feel like there's a whole lot of new 
link that we're writing here. Um, what is new? I'm going to hop over this projection and this DTO. We got to talk about um, what's called a data transfer object. DTO and projections got to probably at some point loop back to these. Um, something that was new to me, and so I believe it'll be new to you guys, and I'm jumping ahead a little bit, is this idea of passing a link query as an argument into a method. And we got this concurrency. I'll come back and talk about concurrency. But check this out. Um, this is something that I hadn't seen before, where you can take a link query. Here's a list method, right? So here's a method called list. And the first identifier is this where identifier. So this is our input parameter. And this right here that's highlighted in yellow is how you accept a link query uh, that returns bool. Oops. Um, and so this where clause allows us to send into the list method a link query so that when you're calling the list method, you could send a little link into the list. And then instead of getting all of your books, you're just getting a, a book list with a link query in it. So that's, that's actually kind of cool. That allows us to then call our list, providing a where clause, where the book's price is less than $10, and an order by clause uh, to order by the book's title. So instead of getting all the books, now we're filtering and ordering by, sorting. So, so that's where we're going. We're going to this place where when we call our list method, instead of getting all results back, we can throw in a little link as, again, these are arguments that are being sent into, and we're passing by name here with this where in order by. And all that just to say, you can kind of abstract all of these expressions and all this into this query options class. And again, this is written with this generic type of T, right? So you can write these query options and then you use these this class instead of directly input parameters, we're gonna use this class to help us specify, like, again, we're ultimately, what are we doing here? We're providing filters and sorting and setting up our use for paging. Okay, so we'll see how this plays out as we code this, but this is what we're gonna code next, this query options class that's gonna allow us to, and if you're looking at this, shaking your head going, oh my gosh, what's going on? Allow me to explain as we go a little bit more, but that's that's the gist, okay? So back in our code here, um, inside of data layer, so models, data layer, add a class called query options. And this will allow us to work with any generic type, right? So this is, this is C-sharp generics. And um, that's ultimately what works behind a list, okay? A C-sharp list can accept any, you can have a list of characters, you can have a list of, of uh, books, you can have a list of whatever your classes are because of generics. So generic just says accept any class as a type. And so because of generics, that's why we get lists with, with generic types. Um, so 
So we're gonna kind of start off here, and again, this is verbatim off of the slide, but we're gonna provide some properties, right? These are our properties, get and set properties for ordering by a where clause, right? Sorting and filtering. These are properties for sorting and filtering. Now, these two things work together. This string array is the backing field for the property, right? So, so auto-implemented properties don't need backing fields, but this property called includes does have a backing field. It's an array of string. So we have this includes property, and you can kind of see here uh, that it's replacing spaces with no space and splitting every word with at the comma into our array. And this third piece is a method that works with that property. So this is a public method Right? Here's a public method that returns a string array, which is right here. This is our string array. So pretty simple method that just returns our string array. That is, that string array is created when we call the set block of this property. And then some read-only properties to read to read these, um, well, I'm sorry. So this read only property is has where returns true or false, has order by returns true or false, has order then by is return true or false. So this is, these properties um, are link queries and these bools are true or false properties to say whether our, our link query has those yes or no. This is a real generic class. I mean, once you write it once, you can just copy and paste it verbatim and you could just reuse it. Okay, and we will use it. Kind of coming up. Um, what I want to do next is make a repository. And I'm going to draw everyone's attention to the auctions app that we did. You guys might remember this auctions app. Okay, and if I close everything on this auctions app, close all tabs. Okay, and if I go back into the, the data layer, right, we had a data layer and we marked uh, a folder called services and we had a interface with our database methods like an add method and a get method so we had an interface and then we had a class that implemented that interface and then we had another interface called listing service and then we had a class that implemented that interface and that was the pattern that we had for every database interaction, we had an interface and a separate class, okay? And this was the abstraction. Instead of putting our database logic inside of our controllers, we put it inside of a data layer, right? And so you, you might have heard the terminology like fat controllers. Fat controllers are controllers that have database logic in them. And that's not considered a best practice. The best practice is to, to take the database logic out and have it in its own data layer, okay? And if you could think back to the JavaScript class, we had our own database module, right? We didn't put the database uh, logic directly in our express servers, right? We, we kind of had a separate file for that. Um, all that we're doing here that's really that much different 
all that we're going to do that's that much different is we're going to do something that's a little bit a little bit slightly more reusable so that we don't have to create a different interface every time and a different listing service every time or a different service here okay and so we're making this interface it's called a repository interface and we're making a class okay that's going to be use uh, it's going to use generics instead of using specific types okay so so that's what we've done a little bit in this class without a lot of explanation we're going to do something similar but what i believe is slightly more reusable um, in this project okay so we're going to start with the interface add in new item I believe we got if you got code interface it's just a CS file we're gonna call this I repository and these are just the methods like at, these are the crud methods is basically what we're defining here um, but we're doing it with C sharp generics where T is a class right all we're really saying is that you have to give me a class something like a student this repository will not work with like it shouldn't work with like ints you know for example you're gonna notice that our list method accepts query options so like I was saying before this class of query options we're gonna pass in link queries via this class of query options when we're listing our things uh, which is pretty cool we're going to have a git method so a nullable type called git by id right so this is a this is a git type by id method right this is a git type with link query right this is obviously a create method of course there's update which is a void return type type of course there's a delete method and a uh, save save changes which will just be void save. So again, if I had to kind of summarize this, is that this is an interface, therefore, what is an interface? It's a list of methods that when you implement the interface, you're forcing those methods to be implemented. Okay, so we're just setting up method headers here. These are all methods and these are method headers, which includes their re return types and their identifiers and their inputs. So we're just making a list of methods that we will use when we actually have our class okay and the the class is going to be you know called a repository class and it's going to implement this interface so we're setting up the crud operations yes so what's what's the main you could just reuse this repository interface on it's just reusability I, I think is the, is it necessary no you could certainly get by without it um, but I think the answer there is just reusability if you need to use this interface elsewhere I mean, think about a lot of times when we're using interfaces we're reusing the same interfaces over and over and over um, and so you're just able to do that yeah um not not a mandatory step uh, you could get by without it um but you get code reusability when you put it in all right um let's make our repository class and again it's nice and reusable so we'll make repository by the way this is called the repository pattern certainly um, software has architectures which have reusable patterns 
And so when you, ha you know, when these patterns are defined, you know, they're considered good architecture, good practice. Uh, and so all we're doing here is kind of reusing this kind of common pattern that's good in software development, right? We were talking about fashion earlier today and, you know, there might be good patterns that are good for your clothing, right? That sell well, right? So when you're reusing good patterns in software development, they work well. So this repository pattern is something that is abstracting the data access out and it works well. So reusing this pattern is considered a good thing. So into the repository class, of course, we're going to implement our interface. I repository again of type T. And the first thing you're going to see is, well, hey, you're implementing this interface and you need all of these methods. So let's control dot and enter. And we get to fill out these methods. Yes. Uh, let me fix this error. Type T. Oh, excuse me. I need to do repository T like that. Where T is a class. So your type has to be a class. In other words, it can't be like a data type like an int. Even though you know, you could argue that ints are in fact classes, that's why they have methods, but it is enforcing, you know, it is, that's, that's what it is. Okay. Yep, it's enforcing it to be a C-sharp class. Okay, now again, this repository class is going to be where we do our database logic. And so because of that, we need our, a reference to our context. So I'll go ahead and bring in our context, protected class schedule context called context and we'll do get set blocks and we're going to work with a table and by setting up a generic type T well this could be a table of student or a table of classes or a table of days, whatever our tables are, this db set variable uh, is generic so it can work with different types of tables. We'll call it db set, get and set. And here's our constructor, public repository, where we will initialize our context and set up our table to whatever type we ultimately pass into the generic. So our table type is set here and our context is set here. Uh, I had to th put uh, on line five, I had to put repository type T. Mm. Okay. I didn't have that at first. Okay, let's start filling in the methods. When we list our, when we list our type, notice it takes a query options type. Again, think link filtering, think link sorting. Um, that's what we set up with this class called options. Let's walk through this code and I'm just going to copy paste what I have here and db set is a capital S. Okay. Remember we said iQueryable interface can store a query. We're going to query our table db set. So whatever, whatever we define as that table when we use the generic. 
We're not using the generic yet. We're just kind of setting it up to be used. So we're going to query the table. Here we have that get includes method. And we're basically updating our query. to include the different types. Now, what is include? Including is when you have, I don't want to use the word children, that's not the right word. When you have properties that are subtypes. And so, for example, uh, our, let me go back to our models and I can explain this. A teacher will include their collection of classes. So if you go back and you've written includes before up until this point, but it's like, yes, we want to include the teacher or we want to have the teacher, but we also want to include their classes. And so this will include those property objects um, in our query, right? So a teacher will include their classes, for example. Here's that Boolean property. If our options has a where clause, then you update the where clause. If the options has an order by, then you use the order by. But if it also has a has then order by, which is what? You're, you're sorting by two things. If you have an order by and then an has then order by, you're sorting by last name first and then first name, right? So we're updating our options with a where clause and with a sort, and then return the query to list. So notice again, iQueryable is just the query. This list method returns iEnumerable. Again, that's, that's the actual data that is a result of the query. This is, the more abstract you get, the harder it is to understand because <laughs> it's not concrete you're not you know um, but we'll we'll get there we're getting there okay so that was the list which is now good um let's go up to the delete and so the delete we can simplify delete quite simply with an arrow function that is db set remove entity the get method get by id returns db set find by id If we have a get with query options, this is very similar to our, our list. Very similar to our list. Define iQueryable, loop through your includes, filter. There's no sorting on this one. We, you could, you definitely could. Uh, insert we can shorten up to an arrow function db set add our save method is an arrow function where we call context save changes And our update is an arrow function to do a DB set update. All right, now that we've got all this database logic kind of wired up, uh, let's close all tabs. 
and let's go to our home controller. We can start working on our controllers and on our views. And so let's delete the logger. Don't need the logger. Don't need anything about privacy and, or error. And let's start. Uh, we used to work with the context here, right? That's what we were doing, but now we're going to work with this a repository of type class called classes. And we're going to have to bring in that namespace. repository of type day called days now our home controller let's bring in uh, our context and we'll initialize our classes equals new repository of class using our context and our days is the same so we initialize these properties here Okay, our index method will accept an optional ID. So, you know, again, working with link a little bit here, ordering by the day ID and for our classes, including our teacher and our day. You know, first time the page loads, this ID should be zero. So there's an if else block here. If the ID is zero, We change our order by, otherwise we do a little filtering here, class options where. So you're only gonna show that one day of classes, right? If you say, you know, a, a day ID of one, then you're just showing that one days of classes. So this is basically no filter versus this is a filter. So here's our day list. Again, calling our list method on our repository days.list. So again, passing these link queries in um, is something that's relatively new to us. So 
these are essentially executing uh, the queries and let's send data to the view And so with that being the case on the home controller, classes and days are being sent to the view. Now we need to display that in the view. So of course, we're going into the views folder into the home index. And we're going to add a model. I enumerable. class. Now to get that to compile, um, here's what I'll do. We got to go to our shared uh, view imports and we're going to add a using Rankin class schedule models dot domain models. So now class should be recognized. Our title. Uh, yeah, so in view, view imports, we had to add that here. Okay, so now we're in the view and let's kind of delete this. Do a little div class of text center. Good old bootstrap tech center. Okay, we've done a lot of code here and had not a whole lot of testing. So this should just basically be a bunch of links with a name and a route ID. And let's launch it and see what breaks. Monday points to home index one, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Sweet. All right, let's continue with this view. There was a link to just add a class. A, obviously we don't have this controller or method created yet. Title, number, teacher, day, time.
because we included the teacher in our classes, we could do c.teacher full name. We included the days as well, assuming it was all wired up properly. And last but not least is military time. Uh, there's one more empty TH up top that I left off. And in that, we will put some buttons. I'll throw some bootstrap classes on it. Class of button, button outline. Okay, same thing. There's a chance that we miss something and it doesn't work, but this is part of testing. Looking good. Of course, we could do some styling up here with our links. Um, I guess think about the routing here so if we hit the home index one right this is all set up to filter based on the ID of one the ID of two the ID of three four no Friday Saturday or Sunday classes this is all correct Oh, we will. Yeah. Yeah. Um, like these these links up here, I think will just take you back to listing all the class. Remember that? Yeah. Can add a little bit of uh, styling on our buttons up here on our for each loop. button dark button button dark otherwise button outline dark so is it the current day do one thing if it's not the current day do something else and then we got to apply this CSS string on our class on our here so class equals at BTN CSS Add some margin to the end and some margin to the bottom. That way current day gets one styling. Other days don't. Now that we have the home page kind of loading, um, there were some other links like displaying all your teachers and displaying all classes so let's make up a teacher controller so we'll kind of close close this for now let's go teacher controller add controller and we're going to pull in our teachers here private repository of type teacher right so it's you know uh, let's bring in is it not oh gosh uh, models teacher 
domain models. by the teacher's last name, return teacher's list, passing in the options. You could change this to a view result if you so choose. And so we should be able to have a teacher index view now. Innumerable I'll just plop this in for you guys. Save myself the typing. I think everything should be self-explained at this point. So let's go to our nav bar and show all teachers in our nav bar. So under shared layout, we've got home and privacy. Let's just make this one our teacher index. Show all teachers. And if we change that link, There we go, getting there. So we could flush out the add teacher, delete teacher. Suppose we could start with the add. From the teacher controller. simple add in the controller add a view called add so this is teacher add again teacher controller
lowercase m. Okay, strongly typed teacher, we've got a form to add method post, validation summary, first name, last name, real simple submit button, and a cancel button. Pretty simple page. So let's go to add teacher, so this should load our page. Of course, we don't have the post written. Um, so we need to put the controller uh, for the post. Okay, for the add post back in our teacher controller, you guys have seen this before, making sure the model state is valid. Now what's different, what is teachers? Teachers is no longer a context reference, but a reference to a repository of type teacher. So uh, it's very similar though. We do the insert method and the save method and redirect to the index of the teacher controller. So we can of course test that at this point that we can add a teacher we can add good old Bob Marley so show all teachers add teacher um, all data validation and there's good old Bob Marley, and we do have a sort, um, obviously by, looks like last name, sorting by last name. And so the next operation is a delete. So, the get method for our delete http get delete by the id take the id in from the route and return that individual teacher to the view which should allow us to add a view called delete with a model of teacher Things to point out here, of course, we've seen this before. We need to hide that teacher ID on the form. And a little making sure you got the right teacher that you're going to delete. All right, back on the controller now, we, we should be able to click the post button. Let's go back to the teacher controller write the post method that accepts the teacher calls the delete method saves send you back to the index on the teacher controller so now should be able to delete bob marley show all teachers bob marley delete teacher bob marley delete and bob marley's gone So what we have left to do is adding a class, making an edit to a class, deleting a class. So we need a controller for those operations, a class controller. And so let's add a new controller.
and bring in our repository now class is more complex than teacher right so uh, here we're working with classes teachers and days so this controller is a little more complex than the last Um, so if you hit slash class slash index, it just redirects you to the index of home. Which makes sense because that's essentially what we have here is, um, you know, all our classes on the home route. So if you hit that route, let's just redirect. Make a helper method. Uh, there's actually two helper methods here uh, that are just for this class, right? So um, one's called load view bag. So we're going to call this load view bag private method. Pass in a string. Inside of there, we're going to load up our view bag full of days, right? So days list. So get all of our days in view bag, get all of our teachers in view bag, and set an operation inside of view bag, which then we can use in like a title uh, a tag. So pretty simple method to put some data into view bag. Kind of three different properties there. first is our add so we'll add a class and call that load view bag passing in the add operation send us to the add edit view so let's get this add edit view that is a class so we're going to go to views Add a folder, class, add a view, called add edit, and we should be able to get the view bag title out of the operation so we can do a little Obviously, say add class or edit class depending on what uh, method you're coming from. All we have on this page is a form 
and an H1, but it is a little bit of markup. As you would expect, all the fields. A couple drop down lists to select your teacher and to select your uh, day. Class ID, a save button, and a cancel button. Get that all on the screen. I'll change this down to maybe 125. All right, let's go ahead and look at the post so that once you click this submit button, we actually save the new teacher uh, to the database. And so back in the, I say teacher, class. So here's our get and here's our post. Now our post needs to handle, even though it's called add, it needs to handle adds and edits. So of course if it's a new class, the class ID will not be generated yet, it will be zero. So we use this is add in a couple places to determine if we're doing an insert or if we're doing an update, right, based on the class ID. So if it is uh, zero, then you insert new class that comes in from the form and we redirect home so basically class ID of zero model state is valid insert the class into the database and redirect home of course we still have to add the functionality for update uh, and if model state is not valid uh, we determine the operation load the view bag and return to the view. So we can test this, save all, and just make sure we can add a new class at this point. Add class, temp class, two, three, four, Charles Corrigan on a Friday. 0800 and class number must be between those values temp class awesome and so edits and deletes on our classes are coming it makes sense to do edit next since we already did add edit kind of one operation Okay, one more helper method to write, which is to get a class by its ID. We'll use this method a couple of times, just like we're already using load view bag a couple of times. Um, we're going to get a class by its ID. So this method returns a class object, little link query, um, including the class's teachers and their days, getting rid of spaces. Um, so you don't got to worry about that space where the class ID equals the ID and returning that class with the options. But if that doesn't return something, return an, uh, an empty class or a new class, right? A new class instance, right? So you're either rec returning an empty class instance or a class um, out of the database. So that get class method will be used a couple of times. And so with that, we can start working with the edit operation and the HTTP get. So let me kind of, um, under add. Okay, so edit obviously will need a class to edit, so you need to pass in the ID. We load the view bag with the edit operation and we call the get class helper method and then send that class in to the view. Yeah, and so because we've rewritten this add method, it really should be an add edit method because it does both operations. 
So we can test this and we should be able to edit one of our classes uh, if it is all looking good. And so here's my temp class. I'll just call it temp class 22 and voila, change a teacher, change a day, looking good. Of course we have the delete operation left and we are done. So delete, not too much more to do. We need a delete method. So underneath edit, let's write a delete. Delete by ID, get the class, return that class to the view. So let's create that view under class. There should be a delete view. Deleting a class, deleting a class. If there's a model, display its title and its number. There's a model, display that teacher's full name, the day and time, with the delete button. So if I go to delete, there we go. Delete. So that's the get on my class controller. Of course, all that's left is the post. Calls classes delete, classes save, redirect to home. And I think if we delete that, right? So we've got add a class, we've got read a class, we've got edit a class, we've got delete a class, we can filter classes. We can also show all teachers. What's left? Maybe instead of this saying Rankin class schedule, maybe change that nav bar, get rid of the home. So let me go back to my view, shared. And this will say, show all classes. And then we can delete this link right here. And I realize I sped up on my end, so my class got a little catching up to do. That's what we'll have time to do today, right? But we've got CRUD on classes. We can show all teachers, and we can add teachers and delete teachers. Of course, you can add edit should you choose. Um, but show all classes, show all teachers. We got a working web, web application um, and a fair amount of new theory as well. So uh, we will stop here.